international visitors is very, very different. Uh, the collection sizes are very different, and then the staff sizes are very different. So this is sort of, uh, we have a smaller museum, we have one that's on the um, mid to, to large end, and then one that's uh, quite large. And so uh, we thought this would be a good way to talk about different um, sort of institutional uh, ways of working across boundaries. So we are going to begin with the folks from MoMA. So join me in welcoming. Hello, I'm Sarah Bodenson. I'm the Director of Interpretation and Research at MoMA, so that's within the Education Department. So today with my colleagues Allegra Burnett, who's the Creative Director of Digital Media, and Stephanie Pau, who is an Associate Educator in Interpretation and Research, we're going to present the MoMA Audio Plus Mobile Guide, or the Process of Research and Development. Um, so MoMA has a long history of collaborating um, to create rich audio content, um, including interview-based interview tours um, for the collection and special exhibitions, a visual descriptions tour that was um, developed by and for visitors who are blind and partially sighted, and then a kids' tour for families and kids who visit the museum. Um, the audio tours are the only uh, free interpretive content available in nine languages at the museum. And actually in 2004, five, we were able to start offering all of our tours free of charge. So um, as a result of sponsorship from Bloomberg. So as a result, the audio is actually one of the largest, um, probably the largest used interpretive resource um, at MoMA. Um, and as I mentioned, for years we've worked with an outside vendor to produce um, audio content um, and then we've also retained the copyright to this material since about 2005. So free dis distribution in combination with this co copyright ownership meant that in addition to offering it on site um, through Audio Wands, we're, we could offer it through a variety of online channels and you can see a selection of those there. So this audio content became the basis for MoMA's mobile program, which started with a browser-based Wi-Fi tour in 2008, and now includes apps um, for both Android and iOS platforms. So in July of 2013, uh, MoMA launched a beta version of the new MoMA Audio Plus mobile guide, which is currently avail available only at the museum, and in the coming months um, will be available as a free downloadable app for your own device, and those versions will replace MoMA's existing free app in both the Google and the Apple stores. So they, that one still exists, but this is a different interface. So in today's talk, um, even though there have been a couple of talks about MoMA Audio in terms of the development and in the Mega Mobile, um, we're gonna really focus on this collaborative um, process of research and development and some post-launch feedback on the mobile guide. So I'm gonna turn it over to Stephanie to talk about the first phase. Good morning, everybody. So the spring of 2012 uh, saw the beginning of a cross-departmental working group at MoMA called RISE, which stands for Reimagining Interpretive Support and Engagement. The primary focus of RISE was to determine what form of mobile, mobile interpretation might replace the traditional audio on devices that we'd been distributing for many years, which were very sturdy and functional, but otherwise pretty limited. Uh, at the same time, RISE was also an opportunity to think more holistically and collaboratively about visitor experience and engagement as a whole, not just in the digital space, but also in the realms of life programming, interpretive content offerings, physical spaces, comfort, and resources. So the RISE core group uh, continues to meet bi-weekly and includes emerging and senior level staff from the departments of education, digital media, curatorial, IT finance development, and visitor services. And in addition to this core group, each core member is also responsible for leading subgroups that involve an even wider network of staffers in brainstorming, piloting, and evaluating new ideas related to the focus areas that you see up here. Uh, social engagement and participation, content, devices and distribution, resources and sponsorship, and infrastructure and software. Um, throughout the process, uh, visitor research and evaluation has been really instrumental um, in allowing the team to prototype, test, and iterate upon new ideas in all of these areas. Um, fortunately, we have an incredible in-house evaluator, a fellow um, whose name is Jackie Armstrong, 
to help us design and conduct both small and large scale studies. Um, and collectively, we've um, completed a number of studies to help us answer some key questions about visitor needs and behaviors. From going out into the galleries to interview visitors about the questions they have about modern and contemporary art works in our collection to finding out how people are using mobile devices in the galleries. Uh, in one such study, we found that the majority of visitors, even those who come to the museum with their own devices, still prefer to pick up a museum-provided device. Visitors cited anxieties from battery life and data plans to roaming charges. And I should say that some of these are actual barriers while others are perceived. For example, MoMA does actually offer free and comprehensive public Wi-Fi throughout the galleries, retail spaces, dining areas, and even interstitial spaces. And really, it's just elevators and escalators where it might drop off. Um, However, it became clear that even though we had this resource, visitors were just not aware of it um, or were unclear on how to access the Wi-Fi. So we've made, um, since doing this study, we've made a more concerted effort to improve messaging and signage throughout the museum, as well as to train volunteers, security officers, and frontline staff who are uh, those who most often field visitor questions. It's also important to bear in mind that these findings are very specific. To MoMA. For one, our audio program is free with admission. Also, um, as you saw in the earlier um, statistics, international visitors make up about 50% of MoMA's total visitors and at times upwards of 60%. Um, and it is, you know, translated into nine different languages. So it's a main interpretive resource. So we really recommend conducting similar research at your institution before making any decisions about device and distribution. In another study, we found that 74% of visitors brought a mobile, um, a, a mobile device with them, and that of those people, 59% brought an iPhone. Uh, we also interviewed visitors about how they tend to use devices at MoMA and found that a significant number of visitors choose to search for information about specific artists and works of art, take photos, and like to share those photos either through email or social media. And we intend to keep conducting this type of research because we know that uh, behaviors around mobile use are rap just uh, shifting rapidly. Um, so based on these results um, and other studies that um, I'm not presenting here, uh, we made a series of decisions about the future of mobile interpretation at MoMA. First, um, it seemed to us that our visitors weren't quite, quite ready to shift entirely to a bring your own device solution. So for now, we're gonna continue providing devices in the museum and maintain an inventory level of 2,000 devices until we notice a further shift in behaviors and preferences. Um, also, given our high take-up rate, the need to staff multiple distribution points, and the amount of content that we produce every year, every year we decided that we didn't wanna go it alone. So while develop, development of the app was in-house, something uh, which Allegra will talk a little bit more about, we continue to have external support for device distribution, maintenance, and audio production. Um, and we continue to remain highly involved in all of these aspects. Another decision we made uh, was to build the core or in-museum app uh, for iOS devices. And this was based not only on those stats that I showed earlier about visitor familiarity, but also the level, level of expertise our in-house developers had with the iOS platform. Um, we also decided to integrate photo taking and sharing into the app, as well as find new ways to integrate um, to aggregate and layer in the wealth of non-audio content that we'd produced over the years. So this included interpretive text, for example, um, audio transcripts, and the reason we wanted to do this is that we wanted to make it easier than ever for visitors to dis discover multiple perspectives and points of information on a single object. We also found that man many visitors um, still look for the term audio guides in promotion and signage. So despite the fact that we have diversified well beyond just um, audio, and we had also brainstormed a ton of snazzy new names uh, for the uh, 
uh, mobile guide, we ultimately branded the next iteration mobile, MoMA Audio Plus. Uh, besides including a word that our visitors still look out for, it's also reflective of the fact that audio continues to be one of the main interpretive resources available in the app, especially for non-English English speakers. And at the same time, the plus signals the addition of a lot of new features and functionalities. So armed with re this research, we embarked on a series of workshops and meetings that helped us envision the next iteration of MoMA Audio. As leaders of the content subgroup, Sarah and I convened thinkers from around the museum to take part in an agile development exercise where each participant was randomly assigned a set of visitor personas in which they uh, would uh, write visitor stories or scenarios <coughs> that articulated what that person might want to do, uh, might want to achieve within the mobile space. So if you're not familiar with that process, um, the structure is shown up here. Um, the stories take the structure of, as a role, I can do a certain task to achieve a certain goal. So we um, then collaboratively, collaboratively sorted the many stories that emerged, and these visitor stories helped define the initial scaffolding of the content functionalities and features for the mobile tour. So I'm going to pass it to Allegra. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit uh, now about the collaborative tools and processes we used in the course of the project. Um, so after these visitor stories were written, education and digital media had a few big sort of brainstorming working sessions where we visualized those stories as wireframes. So these are two blown out versions that you probably can't see very well. But um, so what we did is drew up interface ideas on a whiteboard and then photographed them all to document them. So this is an early wireframe sketch for what was eventually developed into the camera and photo sharing feature. And as part of this project, um, our developers did pair programming with a couple of, with a company called Pivotal Labs, which is not an agile development firm, and, and this has been talked about in previous sessions. But the short version of it is the programmers, one uh, MoMA programmer, one Pivotal program, sit by side, literally sit side by side working on the same code. Um, and at the kickoff of the project, there's what's called an inception meeting, which sounds a little um, ominous, but it's actually kind of fun, um, to define the work that the programmers will be doing. Um, it's a full day, as you can see, but one that covers a lot of ground. And I actually thought it was useful to show you the schedule of how it breaks down, because we actually got through all this stuff in one day, which is pretty incredible. So it starts with a look at the big picture. Who is this app for? What are the goals? What are the risks? What are the different activities that need to take place? Now, we have been having lots of discussions with education and other people in the months leading up to this. But this was the first time it was like, you know, the, the tires hit the ground and we were going to, like, you know, roll this thing out the, out the garage or, I don't know, I'm going to mix all my metaphors at some point here. Um, so then uh, there's a story mapping exercise where all the features that we wanted to include were written on index cards, which we then organized into the different areas, such as the home screen or the object detail. So these mostly take the form of user can blah, 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 such as user can take a picture or user can share a picture. And it's very important to take breaks. It's very important to, as part of the collaborative process that you do things like this. Except don't play against Shannon. He's very competitive. <laughs> So after the break, uh, there's an exercise to estimate the amount of effort and then prioritize all of those stories, which is indicated here by the ones and twos. So um, you know, you're, you're not doing it by time frame. You're doing it just by kind of a range of, say, one to, one to eight in terms of um, the amount of effort it would take to do this particular feature. And I think the reason why I'm uh, dwelling so much in this inception meeting is that it sets up the entire project. So from this point on, it's mostly about refining, reprioritizing, and implementing. So to keep track of all these stories that are being in implemented, we used a shared browser-based program called Pivotal Tracker. All of the stories are entered into Pivotal Tracker and organized into different iterative sprints, which last one or two weeks. You can see here items that have been finished uh, and are ready to be approved and accepted, items that are in process, and others that are ready to start. So it's a constant process of prioritizing and reprioritizing. And so the, in case you can't see, it's sort of done. Um, backlog and icebox. So backlog is sort of everything that's kind of currently being worked on. We also used a cl collaborative tools for the design process. Uh, this program is called Notism, is, and this is one of the early wireframes for the MyPath feature of the app. The Notism program allows us to upload these images and annotate them with the intended behaviors and other notes. 
Uh, we continue to use this program for the rest of the design process. And this is one of the screen designs. All of the pink, pink and purple bits are notes or commentary on the design. And these notes can also hold back and forth discussions about that item. So you can sort of see the, 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 the decisions that were made along the way. Um, regular meetings were an important part of this project for, throughout. Um, so that involved daily stand-up meetings for the developer team, which were literally stand up, have a meeting for 10 minutes and be done. Uh, weekly what's called IPM, iteration planning meetings with the developers and project team to go through all the items on the current and upcoming iterations. So what we did is put Pivotal Tracker on the screen like this and just went through everything in detail once a week. In addition to these meetings, um, we also had um, bi-weekly bi meetings with the entire RISE group as well as meetings of the subgroups as needed. In the months leading up to launch, we made a series of presentations to the various groups around the museum, from curatorial, marketing, visitor services, retail, education, et cetera. And that helped bring up some issues closer to launch and make sure that everybody was sort of aware of what was happening. There was also a big presentation to senior staff at a quarterly meeting. And this was the first time where they could really see the sort of the ideas and the research come together with the implementation. And everybody got really, really excited about it. And that was sort of this, this kind of sea change of, of the, the, the sort of um, general goodwill about where this project was going. Everybody suddenly got uh, went, aha, I see what, what you, you all are working on. So that was um, a very exciting uh, you know, and represented a turning point for the process. I'm going to turn it back to Sarah. Okay, so I'm going to wrap up. Um, so uh, we launched on July 3rd, 2013, and the first few weeks involved a lot of on-the-fly decision making and uh, adjustments in terms of operations and infrastructure. Um, and there were various factors for uh, that, including switching audio guide vendors, um, rolling out this new brand identity throughout the museum online, um, tweaking Wi-Fi in different spaces throughout the building. Um, implementing planned and unplanned network, firewall, server upgrades, because again, it's just basically impossible to anticipate the impact of 2,000 devices until they're physically on site um, and, and sucking at the system. <laughs> um, training frontline staff, again, including we spent a lot of time training security officers, volunteers, um, visitor services staff to make sure they were familiar with the new program and device. And then conversely, um, the, they were very instrumental in, um, well, the, they communicated to visitors and then they, they reported back to us about common questions, technical glitches, and the impact they were having on the day-to-day -day visitor experience. Um, and then a team, really for the first few weeks, a team um, including staff from education, digital media, IT, and antenna gathered once or twice a day, basically first thing in the morning and end of the day, just for 30 minutes or so to exchange information and troubleshoot um, during this large rollout. Um, and sometimes we had like something that would come up a few days and we would take a couple days to solve that mystery and then another little issue would come up. So those meetings, that communication was really instrumental. So we're still in the process of refining and tweaking features of the in core in museum app, and then we're going to start um, the additional development for the downloadable version very soon. This includes design and user experience enhancements um, informed by interviews with visitors who've used MoMA Audio Plus, surveys with the frontline staff, um, and there's been a lot of praise, and the critiques have actually been fairly consistent, so we were able to respond and have resolved um, a lot of those issues um, with an updated version of the app that's coming out very shortly. Um, and to get a better sense of how people are using it, we're going to implement detailed analytics in this version and start on user testing in the next couple of weeks. So again, this, thanks to the iterative process, we have the ability to make changes throughout. Um, and we've started brainstorming additional features related to customization of this museum experience for people and um, features that foster a more social aspect of museum going. So our takeaways, um, just to kind of reiterate, we definitely recommend collaborating from the outset so all parties are invested and informed from the start. Um, this absolutely could not have come to fruition within 18 months without the insights and expertise of such a wide range of staff um, from various departments. Um, and it helped us achieve surmountable goals along the way, but really accomplish a lot within that time. Uh, build upon native visitor behaviors and let visitor stories guide the development. Um, and that goes back to the research Stephanie was discussing, like embracing what visitor habits are rather than kind of trying to fight against them. 
Um, taking a holistic view of the visitor experience um, from digital platforms to spaces to live programs and really just remembering that mobile is only one aspect of that um, interpretive resource and experience of the museum. Um, using collaborative oh, and also conducting that research on an ongoing basis and leaving time to respond and adapt. Also using collaborative tools and resources like uh, Liger was talking about, so not only the de developers, but another team on site at MoMA can be reviewing and making edits and responding along the way, continuing that conversation even if you're in multiple locations. Um, and then finally, the launch is only the beginning. So um, really, when with a mobile project, this is, you know, it's a digital project, but it's um, manifesting itself in a physical space, so it's of the museum. So it's I can't emphasize enough that ongoing communication between the core team, the development team, the frontline staff. It's absolutely essential to keep that going after launch to ensure that the visitor experience is a smooth one of your mobile project. Yep. So that's it for MoMA. On to Warhol. Hi everybody, my name is Josh. I'm from the Andy Warhol Museum. Um, I'm gonna talk about a project um, that we finished about a year and a half ago at this point um, that's had um, some iteration and some, some continuation. And the thing that I'm, I'm really excited about in context of this panel is not only is our museum much smaller and very different focus than MoMA and Cleveland, but the project itself is also vastly different, um, as you'll see. Has anyone here been to the Warhol Museum in Pittsburgh? Okay, awesome. Um, there was news that was broken recently that we're opening an annex in New York. That's all I can say about that. So hopefully we can bring more Warhol um, to the table soon, which is very exciting. Um, so in addition to being one of the largest single artist museums in the US, we also have a very active uh, programming schedule, live music series, uh, performance art series, lectures, bringing in artists, um, and a very active uh, traveling exhibition schedule. We have the largest retrospective of Warhol's work touring East Asia right now as we speak. Um, and it's important, I think, to underscore in context of this project that our full-time staff at the Warhol is only about 35 people. So uh, I'm a department of one, there are a lot of departments of one, and I think that helps frame the context of this project. Um, additionally, as I'm sure everyone in this audience knows Warhol was obsessed with technology in his life as well as his practice. He was one of the first uh, artists to really embrace technology in his art making practice from silkscreen printing through using photo booths and film cameras. Uh, we also have, um, I always think this is really cool for the geeks, so this is why it's here. Um, the, uh, in the top left of this image is this set of stuff from our archives of an Amiga computer and some software that went with it that we just recently were able to tap into for the first time and extract work from, which is really cool. Uh, and of course, this quote, which I think pegs Andy as a futurist, um, he's predicting Twitter and viral, uh, vid uh, viral videos and all of that sort of thing um, with this quote. So the experience I'm going to talk about today is um, a project where we were focusing on Warhol screen tests. And the goal of the project was to see if there's a way that we can offer an additional perspective on Warhol screen tests, aside from just more text um, or audio. So something that maybe is a little bit more interactive. In terms of working across boundaries here, I mentioned our team is super small. Um, it's really just this group of people. And in terms of um, everyone's responsibilities, uh, it was myself working with our two film and video curators, um, our IT department, exhibitions, and visitor services. And I also want to mention that Greg from our uh, film and video team was supposed to be here. We do work well across boundaries, but he had a conflict. So. <laughs> Um, it's not like he hates this project or anything. So we ended up um, uh, working from this archival photo that we have uh, in our collection of Warhol creating a screen test. So basically, uh, in the 1960s, Warhol would create uh, these, this, what the screen tests are basically is uh, people who sat down in front of a, basically a blank projection screen. He would turn a camera on, on them, and then walk away. And when the film ran out about three minutes later, that was the entire movie. And he made around 400 of these that we have in our collection. Um, we started from this, this photograph, and we decided to 
put the guest in the shoes of one of Warhol's subjects to maybe recontextualize the screen test by making their own. So we ended up converting a, a small gallery space based on that archival photo into um, a space sort of evocative of Warhol Silver Factory. We bought a vintage Bolex camera, which you can see. We hollowed it out um, and, and put a digital camera inside of it and put a underneath that little silver box, there's a computer with a touch screen on top of it. And the patron, after going through some um, some dialogues on the screen sits for the same amount of time that a patron in the 1960s sat, so for three minutes. And when they're finished, we do the same sort of magic that Warhol did. Warhol would film at 24 frames per second and play back at 16 frames per second. So we use uh, FFmpeg to slow the video down to the same rate, upload it to the web, make a web page for them, and then send it to them. So it's this weird blended experience of free souvenir, interpretation piece, cool experience sort of all together. And to give you an example, on the left is Edie Sedgwick, and on the right is one of our archivists named Marie who made a screen test. They're both so very similar. They're black and white, silent. They are the same duration. Um, the thing that we really love about these is um, you know, Warhol would slow film down to force the, the viewer to focus on subtle details like people blinking their eyes or breathing in and breathing out. And it's, it's really great to see that happen in both of these. Um, in terms of the development process, again, being a, a very small team and department of one, uh, I developed a prototype in-house using Adobe Air in about a week. Uh, and this was really pivotal, I think. Uh, being the first time that we, I had ever really worked on a project with our film and video curators, it was really important to get something in front of them early and often and to sort of walk them through the process. It's one thing to sit down and talk about it. It's another thing to have them actually touch things on a screen and understand it. So it was a really low fidelity prototype. These are some of the screens that you would see. Um, Sometimes there would be sample text, which our lawyer had to change, and then um, basic keyboard. And it was really important for us to understand and to make strategic decisions, such as do we want people to be able to see their live image while they're making their screen test? When we learned really early on in the process, no, that's a very sort of 2013 metaphor, Skype and FaceTime, and back then that wasn't the case. And people's screen tests change pretty dramatically when they're able to see themselves and when they're not able to see themselves. After we uh, got to something that we really liked, we uh, outsourced all of it to a company in Pittsburgh who developed a, a localized executable that ran very solidly. Mine would crash every once in a while. And we also leveraged um, some software as service, so, um, or hosting services really, um, Amazon and DreamHost, since we don't have streaming video capability in-house. Uh, being very budget-minded, it was also really important that this thing be cheap. Um, the final cost was around $15,000 once we included the space as well. Uh, but everything is off-the-shelf hardware um, and just a little bit of custom software. So it was, was really a great, um, a great success for us in terms of price. So looking back on the project in terms of working across boundaries, I've sort of like pinpointed three things I think are really great to share. Um, and Again, this is a really sort of custom experience, so this may not translate well to other projects, but the first um, question that we should have asked ourselves before we started, and we didn't realize until we were more than halfway through, is where does 1964 stop and where does 2013 begin? And what I mean by this is that a lot of the elements of this project are directly translatable between the 60s and 2013. So cameras and Bolex cameras, um, video codecs and film. But there were elements of this project that weren't, and most notably is this idea of a touch screen, right? This thing didn't exist back then. You, you talk to Andy, Andy would say, move your head over here. OK, I'm turning it on, and he would walk away. So when we came to have to deal with this idea of where do we put the touch screen, what is on the touch screen, should it descend into the ground afterwards so it doesn't look like it's there? All of these crazy questions. Um, there was a bit of, of, of headbutting on terms of where 1964 ends. And I think another really great, this is like the best quote ever from our curator, um, this idea of his, and I'm not mocking, but I think really illustrates kind of how we come from two different places, mm -hmm. is that he thought, well, why don't we make the patrons wait three days to get their screen test instead of emailing it to them instantly? Let's let them wait, because that's how long it took Andy to develop film in the 1960s. So to give you an idea, that's sort of the two ends of this that we're coming from. So we ended up realizing that this is a blended experience, and we had to sort of 
be very strategic about what things were 1964 and what things were 2013. Um, the second bit of hindsight is this idea of who owns guest experience. So again, being a blended, a blended interactive piece, uh, who owns this? Is it a curator project? Is it a, is it a digital project? Um, and I think the best example of, to sort of illustrate this is a very small detail on this very small project, which is uh, we have, you can see there's two lights uh, on the right side of the screen that are on the patron. And when you get to this point in the experience, the lights turn on, they're very bright, they're almost blinding and very awkward to look at. And I had proposed the idea of allowing for interactive sliders, you know, that would let you really adjust your image, really appeal to the narcissism of some of our patrons, <laughs> most patrons. And um, our curator was very much against this. He said, that is not what Andy worked with back then. They were either on or off. And we had quite a few fights about this. And I think really it came down to, at the end, who owns the guest experience? Is this something that makes the guest experience better? The, the ability to choose between zero and 100 uh, steps in the lights, or um, is it important that this stay accurate because the curator owns the guest experience? So we ended up, that's uh, an area where I caved, uh, so they just turn on and off. And then I think the third and probably most interesting that it <laughs> probably works with a lot of, of folks in here is this idea of, of user testing uh, in the gallery space and whether or not we can kick curators out of that process. So I have this one photo, which is the only photo uh, during, the, during the user testing process where our curator wasn't sort of glaring over the user. Um, so he's standing right there. And what, what happened was is throughout the testing process, he would sit in the space kind of quietly or creepily in the corner. And as patrons were doing something wrong, he would say, no, that's not what you're supposed to do. No, don't press that. Oh, wait, we should change this. So, and I, and I should have known this kind of going in, but I, I think sort of looking back, it's very obvious to me that curators in general, but also our film and video curators, follow a, follow a process in the museum and something that they work on from beginning to end. They go all the way from idea, all the way through execution, installation in the gallery space. They're pointing at things to move things around the wall, and then we open it. There are parts of these digital projects that they don't know and that they shouldn't be involved in, such as testing in the, in the gallery space. So for us, um, this really represented sort of the turning point in the project where there was a point where I had to take him to another room and say, listen, the past three tests that we did were complete wastes of time because we're not supposed to interact with the user. We're supposed to let them figure out all of the bumps on their own. So I think that um, that was sort of the final speed bump once we had it in the space. And it was really great to kind of have that talk and he sort of understood and we moved on. But I think that that was a great, a great hindsight. So. In terms of what's next, um, we've made a version of this that breaks down into a suitcase, essentially, and we can take it around the world. I mentioned we travel a lot of exhibits around the world, so this has been um, to a lot of really great places so far, and we're making um, three more of, or I'm sorry, two more of them for a total of three of them. Um, and someone has to travel with it to plug it in, so I get to go to some really cool <laughs> places. And then I don't have any photos of this yet since it's so early in the process, but we're in the, in the, uh, the beginning stages of a rehang of our entire museum from top to bottom, including the uh, distillation of Warhol's film, video, and television into one interactive space. Um, and I am teamed up with uh, Greg and Jer on this project, and I think that I can tell already from just the few months that we've been working on this that uh, it's very different than last time in a very positive way um, because we've kind of gone through this very small project and now we're working on a very large project. Um, so that's all I have. Thanks. Right. Um, so I'm going to be talking about our, um, the Cleveland Museum of Arts Art Lens um, app. and. Um, I thought I'd start by talking about how this kind of came about, the timing on it was that it was timed with uh, the reinstallation of the entire collection. This was an ongoing process. It took a long time. Um, we did an expansion. We have a new atrium. Um, and eventually, the entire collection uh, will be reinstalled. We're opening the last two collections in January. Um, so uh, while we were doing that, we um, also had this other project you guys may have heard of called Gallery One um, that was also kind of a, part of that reinstallation process. 
And in conjunction with that, um, we also did uh, develop an app for the collection called Art Lens. Um, the, they started out as sort of two separate projects, and then they eventually kind of married each other and were done at the same time in a very short timeline. Uh, and uh, even though that they, the actual final product was done on a short timeline, it was something that we had been thinking about uh, in education and interpretation for quite a while. Um, we had actually started out um, with a prototype of the app that we had uh, tried in some of the collections as they reopened um, because we were really thinking about how we could bring uh, digital interpretation into the galleries. Um, so this is uh, just showing the sort of map view of when you're in the Artlands app. It does uh, allow you to go through the galleries. It will pull up um, information about which objects uh, that are close to you have extended interpretation in the app. Uh, it does have location recognition. So that's why the, the map is a, a really important part of it. So it actually places you in the galleries where uh, the interpretation is. Um, the, the sort of background to the, the structure of the categories in the app uh, really are connected to user testing, or um, really looking at audience testing and kind of following audience members around. Uh, we had a very large um, audience research project that we did in 2009 with Mariana Adams uh, that went on for a number of months, and we really looked at what was happening in the galleries with our visitors. What were they doing? What were they reading? What were they spending time with? Where were they socializing? And so this is um, showing a couple of the maps uh, that were done from observations in the galleries of where they were engaging or stopping, talking with their friends, um, or reading the label or reading the text. And that this has informed a lot of what we've done as we've moved forward, both in terms of interpretation with more traditional means like texts and uh, chat labels and things like that, but then also really thinking about what that means in terms of how people, what they're looking for um, when they're looking for interpretive material, uh, whether it's being uh, sort of conveyed through more traditional print methods or through digital. Uh, and with that in mind, that really informed the, the two main categories in Art Lens. Uh, because what we found was, that not really unusually, most of the people that were coming to our museum, most of our visitors, fell into one of two categories in their behaviors. Um, one category was the, the visitor who comes and they, they want somebody to tell them, here are the 10 most awesome objects. Here's where they are. Here's what you need to know about them. And you know they really want a tour. That is essentially what they're looking for. Uh, and then the other group of people, which is actually the larger group of people, are browsers. And they come in, and they walk right past your text panel, and they walk up to the one object that talks to them. They read that one label. They ignore the next 10 objects. They really are sort of picking and choosing. The thing is that I, I think most people don't fit entirely into one category or the other. <clears throat> we all, I mean, I know that I toggle back and forth between these things. Um, and I think most people do. Uh, but those are sort of the two main things that we saw people doing in the galleries. And so we wanted to have uh, the digital interpretation really respond to those behaviors so that we were sort of thinking about what people were looking for and that they wanted um, either structure or some sort of flexibility or they wanted to be able to change midstream. Uh, and so to have those two things be available. So uh, we have one section of the app that is to take a tour. So this gives you that opportunity to have that very structured experience. Uh, and then the other section is the near you now section. That's the one that sort of pulls up what is physically close to you that has extended interpretation. And it allows you to have that kind of browsing experience. You can pick this object, not that object. And then within uh, the structure of the interpretation that's there, there are various uh, video and audio assets, and you can select within that. I want to hear about the artist, but I don't really care about how it was made. Or I really want to know how it was made, I don't really care about the artist. Um, so in order to create the content that was in there, um, which is really where I'm going to be focusing, I know that it's a, it was a very large project. Um, we were, everyone, it sort of seemed like everyone in the museum was, was in that project at some point. But we had a lot of uh, working across boundaries throughout the entire project. Um, there was, uh, you know, membership in the, the, the group of people that were working on it, obviously in IT, um, education interpretation, we had curatorial representatives, we had um, design and architecture. So it was sort of, it was a very large group. We met very regularly. Um, I think we had two, I'm looking back at Jane, and uh, two or three meetings. We had two or three standing meetings a week on this. Three. three. 
We had three standing meetings, and then we had whatever other meetings happened. So it seemed for, for a long time, it seemed like we just met and met and met and met. So there was a, a very large group that worked on this. Um, but for this panel, I'm really going to be talking about the content development, which was uh, a smaller uh, sort of team. And it was uh, within interpretation. Um, there were two of us. And then um, we also. Uh, worked with an outside vendor called Earprint Productions who uh, helped us with uh, the audio. Um, but this, in order to develop this content, it really meant that we were doing a lot of working with the curatorial department because uh, a lot of the content was coming from uh, discussions and interviews uh, with members of curatorial. Um, and so that included you know, figuring out which objects were going to get uh, interpretation as well as um, interviewing for the content. So uh, for, for me, I, part of what happened in this project was that I actually came on at a, a rather late point in the project. I came in in July of last year. Um, the, uh, the app was launched in January. So I came in, and it was sort of like, OK, so you're here. And this amount of content for all of these galleries that will be open in January has to be done. And this is the amount of time that you have, which is like six months to get all of that done with all of the, the video and the slideshows and everything put together. So I was sort of on a mission. It was like I got to say, OK, you know, I have to set off and start talking to basically half of curatorial. I had to get interviews with them kind of within about two months. So uh, one of the collections that was really, really important uh, for to have be part of the, the content was the uh, European painting and sculpture, 1800 to 1960. Uh, and I'm here with our curator from that uh, department. Um, it was really important to have this department be represented because this is a department where Picasso and Van Gogh and Degas and Monet and every artist that people who don't know anything about art have heard of. It's the, the <laughs> ones that everybody cares about, right? So everybody walks in the door and they all say, where's Monet's water lilies? So it, I really needed to make sure that we had content from this department. Um, and so one of my first tasks was to attempt to get the curator of <laughs> European painting and sculpture, 1800 to 1960, in the chair to be interviewed. And he avoided me for <laughs> like two months. I was stalking him. <laughs> and, I mean, literally stalking him. I was, I mean, I would send emails and nothing, and then I would talk to the curatorial assistant and say, well, I really need an appointment. And she'd go, eh. And then I, <laughs> I would come in on weekends and lurk by his office, <laughs> waiting for him to get. And I think that the, the point when I finally got you to agree to the very first interview was that I was in on a weekend, and you were fighting with a copier, which, was, <laughs> which is near where my uh, workspace is. And so I could hear the copier going off and making these sort of alarming sounds. And I thought, who is in here on the weekend with the copier? Bill. <laughs> and, <laughs> And I went running over and I was like, let me help you with the copier. And, and I helped you with the copier and then said, you have to come to an interview. And finally acquiesced. Um, and we had the, the first interview and he did one object. And I think it was, it was a difficult interview for both of us, I think. Um, and I think part of it was that we had had no time. We the, Literally, I think it was the third time I'd, I'd finally actually met you was at the copier. And so it was really actually very difficult to try to explain what this project is, why it was really necessary, why it's really important that I'm, I'm not like a horrible, evil person. I'm not trying to like, you know, do anything bad. Please come and, and do this interview. And so it was really, a, it was really a process. That first interview, I think, was a learning process for both of us. And I think it also meant that that was kind of the, the beginning of where we began to sort of build a relationship and build trust. And so I didn't have to stalk you nearly as much for the second interview. Um, there was maybe a little stalking, but it wasn't nearly as much. And then you came to the second interview, and it was much, much better, I think, for both of us. And I think it becomes easier as you go. And so I think. Part of it was just sort of getting to know the people that you're working with in your collaborative team and getting to understand the things that are concerning to them or important to them, and then trying to build a relationship and build trust. Um, so by the time that we got to the third interview, I thought the third interview went great. 
And then I didn't have to stalk you at all. You actually agreed uh, at the second interview to come to the third interview. Um, so, and this is just to let you know, this, these are the objects that are in Bill's collection. And so, um, in thinking about uh, how important this uh, collection was for, uh, in terms of content for Art Lens, um, so in, this is coming out of what we've learned now that the things are in, that are, are in there. So a quarter of the most opened objects in Art Lens are in Bill's collection. A fifth of the most favorited are in his collection, and the most favorited objects, which is Monet's Water Lilies, is in his collection. So I'm really glad that we <laughs> were able to, to get to uh, the point of, of having, um, sort of working through that collaboration to make sure that this content was in there, because it is the content that we know that people are really looking to, to hear. So Bill, I'm going to pass it over to you to talk about your experience of going through being stopped. Is it safe? <laughs> well, welcome to family therapy. <laughs> Where's Dr. Phil? Um, so um, I was asked to give a curatorial response, and I thought this was going to be a dialogue, but I'll sort of I'll I'll play you. Okay. So here's Jennifer. <laughs> what was your impression of the process? <laughs> Well, uh, I thought it was terrifying, and I'll tell you why. And uh, I'm not sure it was two months, by the way, and I do travel. I'm away a lot. But um, <laughs> so I was used to writing labels and text and even audio guides. Um, so uh, when I first did my first big show, I wrote the audio guide. Even though we were working with Acoustic Guide, I wrote it, script, the entire script. And I learned to kind of let them do a lot of the work, but I still was always very, very heavily involved. Um, I don't think I'm a control, control freak, but I, re I really think that there are a couple of things that are critical. One of them is accuracy, and the other is, I mean, you're trying to convey a lot of information in a very short amount of time, so you really have to condense. And unless you have some type of um, input into that process, you know, the kind of minor unimportant things get bandied about and the major things get overlooked. Um, <clears throat> what was really different about the process that, that we encountered, yes. is that Jennifer wanted to do a kind of spontaneous interview. So you do this over some time. I think we actually may have taken an hour or two hours. It's two hours. Two hours. And then they would take this and slice it up and cut it down to about a minute, minute and a half. Mm -hmm. And um, the two issues was, with that is that I'm not doing the editing, so I have no mm -hmm. control. And um, also, when you're doing that, you know, you're really worried about making mistakes when you're being recorded. It's a totally different process than writing. So I think it's, um, for people who've never done that, uh, it's difficult. And from my per perspective, looking back on it, the other difficult thing is it's not something I do every day. In fact, you know how many times I've done this? Just a couple, and like once, maybe every five years. So it's not as if I'm an anchor man on TV or something like that who's used to standing up and speaking in that way. Yeah. I just don't do it, so it's a very difficult and awkward process. And it does get easier as you go along. Um, I think you're right, Jennifer. The, um, the first attempt was difficult, and um, I, I do have to say that Jennifer made it easier because she's a very kind of bubbly, positive person, and she compromises, so she allowed me to bring notes. Yep. And I got into this awkward situation where I had these notes, and I would kind of read from the notes, and then she would ask me questions, and I realized later that you're very hesitant because you're not sure what you're supposed to be doing. You do either do one or the other. You either read a script or you do it totally spontaneous. It doesn't, you cannot do the middle ground. It doesn't work. Um, and just what have we learned is my next question. Um, I'm not sure that I totally like the results. And I'm, and I'm, you know, there's some of it that I like and some of it I don't, and I do ask my curator curatorial colleagues, and they have the same impression. Um, the problem is that, you know, it takes a lot of time to go back, mm -hmm. review, re-record. Not only it takes time, it costs money. And time is something that, as Jennifer said, we have been very pressed for because we've been, you know, just opened this big new building and reinstalling all of the collections, and we've got, you know, I've got three exhibitions going, so it's really hard to find mm -hmm. the time to do that. And, and I do understand that this is a collaborative process and we need to work together and we just kind of need to find that right balance and it's a process and it's an ongoing process and I think we, keep, we do need to keep reviewing it. Mm -hmm. So what so um, we're going to do on the plane? <laughs> <laughs> Anytime you like. Um, <laughs> I do, I mean, this issue, I mean, you, you may think I'm being really 
picky about this thing about accuracy. And um, we have a former chief curator uh, who was a good close friend of mine. And we were walking through the galleries just before we opened, and he could see my eyes getting really narrow. And he said, "Stop obsessing." <laughs> <laughs> and I and I get it. But also, I was recently quoted in a lengthy interview in the New York Times about my Van Gogh show, and the quotes were inaccurate. Mm. The information was inaccurate. I was just appalled. But I took a deep breath and I sat back. And sure enough, here comes the emails from colleagues at other museums. What a wonderful interview, blah, blah, blah. So, so maybe we can be a little overly picky. But again, I think the balance is really critical. And it, it's going to require a lot of work and collaboration. So. So I, I think we are going to be, <clears throat> excuse me, collaborating um, as we continue to move forward. I thought I would uh, play one segment uh, from interviews that uh, we did. And this is on one of our uh, Degas pieces. And it's actually one where there's two curators. So we have Bill and then the curator of drawings, uh, Heather Lamonides. During Degas' early years, you often see him depicting mm. the performance of the ballet. As he progresses, increasingly, he's focusing more on private moments, on things that happen backstage. These dancers train, and their bodies are pushed off into the limits. And I think in some of these awkward kinds of positions, he's reminding us of the human body and its physicality, and also the strain and the pain that they have to endure for their art. And the guy Although there's an impersonality about the way he presents them, I'm sure, in a way, identified with the ballet dancers as fellow artists. There's a moment in which, of course, they're sort of thrown away into the trash. They're just left. They've sort of done their performance. They've made their name, but then they're abandoned. And that's the course of the life that happens with many artists. Can I just say this? I would not have picked those moments from the interview. <laughs> not, that's not what I would have picked. So. We could talk about that. <laughs> I mean, I think one of the, so, so um, just for the recording, so um, Bill is saying that he wouldn't have, have picked those moments. But the thing that I think is interesting is that, um, so we did this very large um, visitor study before uh, we kind of launched into the app. But one of the things is that we, we do a lot of kind of follow-up and, and talking with visitors and doing a lot of kind of guerrilla evaluation as well, where you're sort of, you know, like, hey, how do you feel about this, warm, cold, you know, and trying to get responses. And we've had, like, really positive responses uh, from visitors, because I think for them, one of the things that they're often interested in is that kind of, that type of story. Like, they are really interested in stories. Um, but as, as you know, as we've discussed, we've talked about this a lot, that, you know, any, anything's having, anything having to do with accuracy and any concerns about that, that we're always open to, to going back and revising and changing because, you know, it is a collaborative process. And I think right. it's one that we're going to continue to work through because, in part, we're still creating new content for the app. And, but, you know, we, we do want to have something that is something that makes sort of all of the constituents feel solid about it. So um, with, did you want to say something else? You know, accuracy is one thing. That's probably mm -hmm. the critical thing. Oh, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. But, but there's also a secondary issue, and that's appropriateness. I mean, is that, not that it's inaccurate, but is that the key thing that you want to say about that work? I don't know that it's the key thing that I would want to say about it, yeah. but it, that is also one of five uh, videos for that, uh, mm -hmm. that painting. So right. there are, I think, as a, as a whole, mm -hmm. like that it, taken as a piece of a larger, right. kind of uh, the larger coverage of that object, um, I, you know, I, we've, People have liked having that kind of idea. I, I don't know how you've tested this. My guess is it's <laughs> anecdotal. In other words, you get feedback. Mm -hmm. But you don't go through this with like a test group and you say, rate this response one to five. How informative is this, you know? No, we haven't done that. Right. But I think, I think the other thing is that we have audiences that are diverse. Mm -hmm. So for some people, yeah. That's exactly what they want to hear. Right. For other people, they want to hear about the artist. For right. other people, they want to hear about the process. For other people, they, they want to hear about the context of the, the time period. Right. Or they want to hear about you know, impressionism. Or, so I mean, I think it's different for different people. I mean, when we look at the analytics, we see that people are opening all of the, the assets. But they don't, it's not exactly <laughs> the same number of each one, right? Like, it's not exactly 500 people have opened all of these. 
It's that some of them get open more, some of them get open less. Do you have a statistic on which ones get closed the fastest? <laughs> <laughs> Not off the top of my head. We could talk about that when we get home. <laughs> yeah. It's in Um, so I'll, I'll just repeat the question. Um, so the, the question was whether or not they're opened uh, sort of according to where they are on the page. And that was actually something that we thought a lot about uh, when we were, uh, you know, looking, when we, as we've looked at the, the analytics, like, is that what's happening? Um, the one at the top is often the most opened, but not always. And what we found is, you know, ones where there are like, say, three or four assets that the ones that are most open may be the first one, and then the, the next most opened is the last one. So we know that people are actually choosing. Um, but I mean, often you hit the first thing in a list. But when we prioritize them, we um, tried to, to always have the one that was first be the one that felt the most introductory. So it gave that sort of broader uh, sense of the object so that it didn't feel like, because most, we know most people open thing, the first thing in a list. So we didn't want them to necessarily open it up and then feel like they kind of walked in halfway through a conversation. Um, and speaking of what visitors have to say, so we're, we're in the process of doing a very large, very comprehensive evaluation um, of both Gallery One and ArtLens. And um, we have, this is very preliminary, so I was, I was told by our evaluator that I have to tell you it's very preliminary. Um, but one of the things about, this is from video, uh, one of the things they did was that they videotaped um, a number of different groups of people going through the galleries uh, with Art Lens. They gave them a video camera and said videotape your visit. Uh, and so this is actually a quote from one of those videotapes. Um, and so the part that I love is, as, and as awesome as the museum is at having those little credit cards, by which, you know, they mean like the labels, um, and having a little bit of, I know, right, like, it was like credit cards, are we having, I, I didn't get one of those. Um, <laughs> and having a little bit of stuff there, it's not the same thing as having a curator tell you the calligraphy around the piece of, of the mosque means, you know, and I think that's really um, a great way to expand. And so the, this idea that having that voice with people is actually something really people are interested in. Um, and in terms of, um, so the other quote that I have up here that I, I really like um, is asking about whether or not the level of information on Art Lens is good and the response is more, 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 which is I think for us both great because it's like, yay, that's great. And then it's sort of terrifying because it's like, wait, I have to make more. Um, but I mean, it's good. It, it is good to hear that. Um, I will say that uh, out of this, that the next project, which happened uh, kind of overlapping with this, was, that Bill and I worked on was for um, his Levy exhibition, and we did a, an app that was in the exhibition, and that was something that we worked on together. And I think that that um, process of working on that was really informed by our having worked together already on Art Lens. And so now we're in the process of uh, working on um, the interpretation for Van Gogh show. So um, I, I think that it, you know, there was this sort of turning point where I think we did, we kind of got to a point where we were like, all right, I kind of, I think we both sort of started to, to understand more about what the other one was looking for and to, to trust that we were actually on the same side. Um, so, I think for us, the lessons that were learned, um, so it's hard to describe the non-existent. So of course, this is an app, I didn't have anything I could show. So in my stalking, I'm like coming up and I'm like, I need you to talk on this thing that I can't show you, but it, trust me, it's gonna be awesome. And that that's really hard because people are sort of like, well, it's a what and how do you want it to go? And it's, that is really difficult to kind of get around. Um, and so when you're sort of planning a collaborative project, I think building some, almost empty time at the beginning, which is not like critical, oh my God, we have to get something done time, but time where you're starting to figure each other out, um, particularly if it's somebody that you haven't collaborated with before, is a really, like I would really recommend that. I wish that, um, you know, that it had been possible to have a little bit more of that on this project, because for me in particular, I had just come to the museum, so I had collaborated with nobody that I was then collaborating with. And so it was very difficult to kind of try to like, all right, we're gonna try to like work out and build relationships, but we gotta, I got two weeks, so let's get on it. Um, <laughs> you know, it was like very difficult. So I mean, I think if you're, if you can build that time in at the beginning where you're not immediately sort of setting up things of like, we have to get this and that and this done, where it really is more about kind of talking through what 
where your perspectives are for each of the people on the team, uh, I think that can be really helpful. <clears throat> um, patience really is a virtue, and that's for everybody. So um, it's not just like being patient with having, you know, having to kind of chase down Bill, but you know, Bill is very patient with me as well. And so I think, you know, having like having that be kind of a touchstone to go back to, like, okay, everybody needs to kind of step back and try to be a little patient with the process. Um, is, is a good kind of place to come back to whenever you can. Um, and I think the one thing is that, you know, in museums, the one thing I think everybody can agree on is that uh, we're trying to do this for the visitors. So having that also be a touchstone, that like when you get to a point where you're like, ah, this isn't working, to say, you know what, we both actually want the same thing. So we're, like the visitor is really the important thing in this calculation, so let's, let's talk out how we're going to support the visitor's engagement and how we're going to help them make meaning uh, when they come to the institution. I think that um, is something that's also a really good thing to always come back to. Okay, great. Well, thank great. you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>